This is the second time that we've had Dr. Carol McKibben with us. Uh, I've come to know Dr. McKibben over the last five or six years as she has put thousands of hours into a terrific book called Salinas, A History of Race and Resilience in an Agricultural City. This is a terrific portrayal of the history of the city and the many, many, many events, ethnicities, challenges, and successes that have made Salinas what it is. Uh, she's visited us before to talk somewhat about the, the history of the chamber in shaping the city. Tonight, she's going to talk about pageants, parades, festivals, and events. Uh, she is affiliated with Stanford, and uh, you know, as we've always given Jim Bogart a hard time for, oh, yeah. Yeah, for being from USC, because I know he'll be watching this. Uh, we do want to celebrate her role in the region in documenting unique histories, not just in Salinas, but another, another great history that she's, she's done work on is in Seaside. Um, but a friend of Salinas. Thank you for always um, mentioning that. It's, you've got fans in Seaside too, lots of them. Uh, and, right. and here in, in Salinas. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Carol McKibben as she shares a lecture with us. Thank you, Steve and Gino and the Salinas Chamber of Commerce for having me back. How does a city create comity? in an environment notable both for its diversity of ethnic and racial groups, its dependence on the at best unstable economy of agriculture, and the almost constant threat of confrontation, sometimes leading to violence over labor rights. Salinas residents faced just this dilemma at the turn of the 20th century, and they met this potential threat to establishing a peaceable and thriving city by inventing an identity that unified them, that bound them together in common purpose in their creation of Big Week, or the Salinas Rodeo. And at the same time, they made plenty of room on the community calendar to, to celebrate diversity of culture, allowing even the most reviled immigrants room to feel included, not merely tolerated in city life. So as I talked about last time, I focused on the 1920s, the population increases, agricultural and business development, and tourism associated with Salinas's designation as the county seat and with um, its predominance in agriculture and business. It fulfilled the pro pr uh, promise that was the original intent of its founders to become the center for the Central Coast region. The Chamber of Commerce created Big Week, or the Salinas Rodeo, to support that effort, but it did something else too. It identified Salinas and all of its residents with its origins as California, California ranching culture, as much as with this new 20th century agricultural incarnation. This celebration then served to embrace and include all of its residents um, in the parades and the events surrounding the parades that happened beginning in 1911. Although Salinas, as in most other agricultural places in California, race and ethnic diversity were a normal part of the social fabric, not everyone's incorporation into town life was on an equal footing, right? Today, I want to talk a little bit about a few examples in Salinas' history that illustrates how inequality was softened by pageants and parades and these events that created an inclusive cultural environment. I'd like to start by looking through the eyes of a little girl born in 1919 in Salinas. Blanche Atai recollected life in Ch Salinas' Chinatown oh, at the turn of the last century. She did not live on a farm as a stereotypical Chinese contract laborer, but as a daughter of Salinas' Chinese merchant class, originating from San Francisco and connected to the Tongs there. She went to integrated public schools and she played on integrated sports teams when she was a child. She remembered how included she and her family felt culturally in the rodeo. 
She described the parades and the celebrations in really glowing terms. Rodeo week was full of fun, she remembered. May and Ada Chan, two of her female cousins from San Jose, came to visit us for a few days. We enjoyed nightly visits to the carnival, which was set up by the train depot. Just to be in the crowd with bright night lights was exciting. My family looked forward to the Saturday night rodeo parade all down Main Street. But her middle class mother was never invited to join Salinas's mainstream social groups, women's groups, and her wealthy father was excluded from the elite economic world of clubs and politics in Salinas. Her family lived in Chinatown, a neighborhood segregated by race and the least developed part of the city. She referred to herself as living on the other side of the tracks, despite her family's class status that had they been white would have allowed them to live anywhere in the city they wanted. Her story and so many others showed that cultural inclusion mattered because it made even those most targeted by racist policies and practices, even violence, as Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans were in California, feel better, accepted even, as part of the Salinas community, not apart from it. The Chinese Community Center opened officially on April 17, 1961 to great fanfare, garnering statewide and even national attention. Senator Fred Farr called it a great landmark, evidence of inclusion and respect for the myriad contributions of Chinese Americans, not just to Salinas, but to America itself. We were all Chinese together one resident recalled, overlooking the very real anti-Asian exclusions and racism still in place in America in the 1960s. My own 2016 visit to the Chinese Community Center in Salinas showcased none of the racism directed at people of Chinese ancestry, historically or in the present. Instead, the walls are and were adorned with displays of Chinese American sponsored floats and mementos of participation in the Salinas Rodeo, in the Fourth of July parades, and of the multiple events that serve to include the Chinese American community as a vital part of Salinas's communal culture. I'm going to move the slide. And that's kind of an indication of how inclusive the Rodeo celebrations were, at least in the 1940s, but still, and felt. Salinas's Filipinos also balanced exclusions with enough acceptance to make them feel a sense of belonging to the greater society of Salinas. It gave Filipino immigrants and Filipino Americans hope that they could overcome the racist system that marginalized them, whether or not that was true. After the Spanish-American War ended in 1898 and the Philippines became an American protectorate, Filipinos arrived in the U.S. in great numbers, but were uniformly disrespected and disdained everywhere, and especially so in California. They were insular subjects rather than citizens or potential citizens as European um, immigrants were. They were meant to replace those immigrant workers from Asia, Chinese and Japanese and everybody else from the entire continent, and Southern and Eastern Europe. European immigrants who were now denied immigration based on rigid racial exclusions, which were disguised as quotas based on national origin. And these culminated, that culminated with the Johnson-Reed Act of 1924. But instead of being valued as workers, Filipinos were poorly treated, paid wages that barely sustained life, and then were generally feared and despised when they became labor activists. Ron Caucus graphically described his father, John Caucus's journey to California by way of Hawaii, as so many other Filipinos did. He was only 18 years old, a baby. And he scolded his compatriots for their situation on board ship. And I'm quoting, the Filipino workers in steerage would go up on the deck in their underwear. 
the first class passengers would look down on them like they were in a zoo. My father jumped up and shouted, look at them. They are looking at us like we are animals. Put on your shirts and shoes, look decent. And he singled himself out at that point and became a leader among the workers that were coming to San Francisco. And in that moment, everything changed for this family. John Caucus, the father, created a contracting business, became a middleman in agriculture, bought property, got married, had children, educated them, and became a prominent member of the Filipino community in Salinas, who sided with growers and shippers during the strikes of the 1930s, even though he was disdained by them behind the closed doors of the GSA. Almost all that we know about Filipino American experience was that Filipino people were being targeted by mobs and as members of, of this oppressed agricultural workforce, vilified for their ferocious labor activism throughout California. In Salinas and throughout Monterey County, Filipinos felt the sting of racism, as did many other minority groups. Filipinos were beaten by gangs in Monterey and Watsonville and maligned in the press. Many single men labored in the fields for years without a chance of building families or any upward mobility. They lived mostly in neighborhoods in Salinas designated by ethnicity and class, and they rarely held local political office or served on any boards and commissions. Their organizations, particularly women's organizations, were defined by race and ethnicity, and often separate and always separate from white groups. Although the Chamber of Commerce and the Grower Shipper Association included members who were not only Filipino, but also Mexican American, Chinese American, and Japanese American. Yet, Ron, when I interviewed him, did not mention any of this none of the racism that was so prevalent in Salinas when I interviewed him in 2018. Instead, he proudly described in glowing terms the myriad Filipino cultural celebrations in Salinas that drew attendees from all over the state and included prominent politicians such as then Congressman Leon Panetta. In the, he, was, he participated in this famous roast pig communal picnic, showcasing the importance of Filipino community's spirit in Salinas. From the 1920s until the beginning of World War II, the entire city of Salinas shut down in order to celebrate Filipino war hero Jose Rizal with a huge parade down Main Street with floats and princesses beauty pageants and oratory, all at the initiation of the middle class Filipina Women's Club, whose members appeared before the city council and demanded and received support to fund the event and honor Rizal. It was an event that brought tens of thousands of visitors from all over California to Salinas. Speakers included David Starr Jordan from Stanford and every city official imaginable. The Filipino community worked in close partnership with the Salinas Chamber of Commerce and a multitude of other mainstream local organizations, like their Chinese counterparts. Filipino groups also actively and enthusiastically participated in all citywide celebrations, contributing money, floats, and support to the 4th of July parade, the rodeo, and other events on the community calendar. And you see here the official car in one of them. And here's another um, example of participation by uh, ethnic groups. It was striking that this particular Filipino event was so clearly accepted as integral to Salinas's cultural and social calendar at a time in history when Filipinos were being treated so badly in California. Yet, here in Salinas and elsewhere, Filipinos believed that they were an important and valued part of the fabric of the city because they were, just like every other minority group who lived here.
they were included in the ways that Salinas' residents defined themselves as a community and celebrated their cultural differences as a truly multicultural, multiracial American city with the common thread of agriculture to bind them. Filipinos became important stakeholders in Salinas and in other rural cities in California, just as other Asian communities, Mexican Americans and African Americans did. They fundamentally changed the places they chose to live, first and foremost by claiming space on the city's calendar for their own ethnically defined pageants and celebrations, but also in supporting one another's cultural events and the multiple citywide celebrations of identity that drew Salinas' residents together in one community. Race and race relations were not just about oppression, or exclusion, but complex mixtures of inclusiveness and marginalization in Salinas and elsewhere, which is exemplified in the way we celebrate everything. Japanese Americans faced similar challenges. Henry Sakata was a lettuce grower and seed producer and bona fide member of the Grower Shipper Association. He was included in the agricultural establishment, as were other people of Japanese and Mexican descent who acquired land and wealth in the beginning in the era of green gold in the 1920s. That inclusion was limited, however. In 1932, at a meeting held with white members only, a newly available parcel of 6,000 acres was considered at risk. Whites feared, and I'm quoting, the Japanese would likely take all such lands. So they advocated invoking the Alien Land Act against their own members. And moreover, they launched an investigation of all Japanese-owned land to, as they put it, eliminate some of the competition from the more capable Japanese farmers. Ouch. Although people of Japanese descent might have felt that membership in the GSA was evidence of inclusion, and they steadfastly supported the growers in the ferocious labor battles both in the 1930s and 1970s, the incarcerations after Pearl Harbor of even children, old people, and American citizens of either uh, gender, who couldn't possibly have been a threat to the American uh, nation, reminded them of a harsh and prevailing racism. But <laughs> in the replenished community that formed, albeit in smaller numbers, in the post-war, and then in the aftermath of the 1965 Immigration Act, with, uh, which then opened Asia up for immigration, Salinas residents from every ethnic group, including whites, attended the Oban Festival at the Buddhist temple in July, which not only honored ancestors, encouraged gratitude and reflection, but also invited non-Japanese people into the temple to showcase Japanese culture, martial arts, flower arranging, bonsai and tea ceremony, dance performances, music, and Japanese food remain the centerpieces and serve to educate and also to fundraise. The temple, it is the biggest public event on the temple calendar and the biggest fundraiser of the year for the Salinas Japanese American community. My interviews with older Salinas residents who are not Japanese frequently pointed to this festival as an opportunity to show me that they had gotten over any feelings of hostility towards Japanese um, people brought on by the war years. It was, that was the evidence for it. Uh, Salinas' routine celebrations of Japanese culture and the inclusions of people of Japanese ancestry in the city's cultural events, such as the 4th of July, and the Rodeo, which they supported and contributed floats to, made Japanese Americans in Salinas feel welcomed, feel a part of the community, and often offset the racism 
that was the history, that was in this history. It's important to appreciate and understand that an ethnic float in the 4th of July parade or the rodeo really meant something to those who contributed the labor and the money to create it. Salinas's Asian communities have come together in an alliance to celebrate their history and cultural culture as Salinas's history, not separate from it. In numerous public history events uh, and celebrations through the organization of ACE, or Asian Cultural Experience, culture being the defining word here, right? The Chicano Chicana Civil Rights Movement divides Salinas's residents still. Beginning with the 1970s great boycotts and the strikes of that decade, Mexicans and Mexican Americans faced severe racism in Salinas. However, that movement also brought a new population to Salinas and inspired a vivid renaissance of Latinx culture in everything from city architecture to cultural events. It has had, ha it, it has had an undeniably profound effect in claiming Salinas as a proud, vital Latinx city. Beyond Cinco de Mayo, which is really an American celebration, <laughs> and September 16th, Mexican Independence Day, Salinas as a city embraced numerous other um, showcasing uh, Mexican-American culture and Latinx culture. Most recently, the Peruvian-inspired a celebration of Ciclovia in March closes streets off to traffic, encourages healthy exercise and inclusivity. It's explicitly intended, as all the ethnic themed and community wide parades and events are intended, to foster community building in Salinas, to encourage diverse groups in this city to find common ground and common purpose. These celebrations do not eliminate racism or political polarization, of course, but they are not nothing. These cultural celebrations and inclusions provide diverse cities like Salinas powerful ways to create communal culture. In Salinas's case, an identity based first and foremost on agriculture and on ranching, but also on its rich, multi-ethnic, multi-racial population, which can serve as a unifying thread that brings this together, this community together in common purpose. Thank you.